Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending August 20th, 2016. This first story is from Popular Science. The world's longest airship, the Airlander 10, decided to do a crash dive. The sky is forgiving, but the ground isn't, according to the article. The Airlander 10, a long and bulbous airship that borrows design features, both from flexible blimps and rigid zeppelins, is trying to fill a void in the sky, largely abandoned after the Hindenburg crash. It's a large vehicle, faster than a cargo boat, and slower than a cargo plane. It has a distinctive shape that calls to mind a certain human part of a human anatomy to the delight of journalists everywhere. I guess what happened is they actually, when they were launching it, got some cables snagged. Witnesses reported that a line hanging down from the airship snagged a wire, bringing the whole vehicle into a nose dive down. So, going to have a little bit of repair on uh, this ship before they get it back up flying again, I'm guessing. It seemed like it hit pretty bad. Um, it says, lessons like this are reason aircraft have test flights so that the problems can be seen now and protected against in the future. Uh, this next one is from, uh, it was sent by my friend Navy Thomas 8. Tom, what if scientists found life on the closest planet, Proxima B, which as you know, Proxima B is like uh, four and a half uh, light years from us. And uh, they, what they actually did is they detected the wobble of the star. I mean, they've got these pictures and they've got people, all this stuff in people's minds about, look here, we found another Earth-like planet. No, all they have is they've detected that some type of object is most likely orbiting the thing. If they if they got it right, they're going to have to confirm this because it could be just noise and stuff like that because even noise can form a pattern. But it's likely that some type of object is circling the uh, star Proxima Centauri. And they're calling it, they're giving it a name already, they're calling it Proxima B. And even if it is something that does pan out as being true, it could be quite a bit larger than Earth. It could be Earth size. It could be so far into the go inside the uh, Goldilocks zone that it's scorching hot like Venus. It could be so far away that it's very cold like Mars. So their definition of where the Goldilocks zone possibly could be too is kind of stretched with this. So um, what they're trying to do right now, since they don't have any image of it, it's just based on the star's wobble, is to try to develop the equipment to get a single pixel image so that they can actually they could actually run it through a prism and actually get some things about the chemicals on this planet and stuff like that. Uh, I've heard people talk and I've seen articles too about, hey, you know, once we know there's planets in uh, some of the closest stars, let's send some probes that way. Well, we're still, and I did an article about it previously too, about sending many small probes to the closest stars. And we're still talking about decades away to get all the engineering right, to get the kind of drive system that can do it. Um, the fact we may have to send multiple small probes because you're talking about quite a journey here. Even if we get craft up to a small percentage of the speed of light, let's say ridiculously fast, like 10% of the speed of light, that's 4.5 billion light years away, so you're talking 45 years. If it's more like 1%, that may be 450 years. So we're talking likely the probes will be sent out by people that won't even be alive to hear the re probes report back. Let's say something like, uh, let's be generous and say in 100 years, these probes actually reach the star, they'll start sending the signal back to us and it'll take a hundred years for the signal to reach us back again. So that's two hundred uh, years from when we first launched the probes to getting an answer of some sort. And realize too, when these probes approach the planet, they're not necessarily going to be engineered to be able to go into orbit around these planets. They're going to be going really fast. I mean, a few percent of the speed of light is extremely fast. We may get nothing but uh, just a few fast pictures as they're passing these planets at a, at a really fast rate. So um, even the information may be, may be very limited too because uh, having a planet catch an object going that fast into orbit, not likely unless uh, even some other technology really gets developed in the future. Uh, let's see, what's next? Um, this one is from uh, Space Flight Insider. ULA's workhorse Atlas V selected for Mars 2020 mission. I've talked about this before that they're sending another probe up that's uh, similar to the probe we have on Mars right now working for us. And uh, this new probe is actually going to start listening with a microphone, which I've been talking about for a long time. But uh, this is a little bit about the uh, NASA's, again, used the United Launch Affiliates to provide launch service for the flagship mission to Mars. The agency announced that ULA has been awarded the contract to launch the Mars 2020 rover atop the Atlas V 541 vehicle and is aiming for liftoff on July 2020. Not a real big surprise here. I mean, the Atlas is about as reliable as they come from rocket ships. They've uh, by far the majority, if not all, the uh, 
probes that are successfully operating on Mars have been launched by them. So um, they're probably going to be, uh, for any other Mars missions in the near future, they're going to be some of the ones that do too. But if you get a chance, check out the article. It's real nice. And as usual, all the links to all the articles will be down in the description box below. And who is this? I'll make sure these are, I get these by the uh, person that sent this. This was sent by Chris P. from Fortune Magazine. GoPro says profitability is right around the corner. Um, after another quarter of steep sales declines, it's been a rough year for GoPro, but the action camera company promises that its losing streak will turn around during the upcoming holiday season. GoPro CEO Nick Woodman declared Wednesday on a call with an analyst that GoPro is about to have the most exciting fourth quarter ever in history. And uh, basically the excitement is just that they slashed a lot of jobs, I guess, after the revenue plummeted about 47%. They slashed 100 jobs, so now maybe they'll be able to make a profit. Um, the thing I see that's really killing GoPro, and I like GoPro myself, I'm a fan. They're the Cadillac of the action cameras, but boy are they pricey. I mean, the entry level for some of the models when they're first released is somewhere in the ballparks of uh, 400 to $500. And when you have some of these Chinese knockoffs, they can, I don't know, to me, do about 95% as good of a job as a GoPro for like 50 bucks. You got quite a competition there, and it's going to be kind of hard to, to come up against. So GoPro is going to have to come up with something to stay well ahead of their competition, well ahead of the Chinese knockoffs. And last up, if you've gotten, uh, you've probably either seen it posted on Facebook, seen it in the news, or maybe you've even gotten an email like I did. If you're a Dropbox, use, Dropbox user, they've asked you to change your password because uh, a lot, especially users uh, around prior to 2012, if you have had a Dropbox account, um, they have reason to suspect your passwords could be compromised. But this is not because of them. At first when I saw this posted, I thought, well, they're not claiming that their site got hacked, and I believe them that they're being truthful. I was wondering if maybe somebody in IT got fired and it was under bad circumstance. Well, evidently, I read the article, and what happened back in 2012 is a lot of people that are out using Dropbox also use other sites, obviously, and some of these other sites did get hacked. And since people tend to repeat their same passwords, if you're a certain username like John Smith, and you use password ABCD on Facebook and you use password ABCD on Snapchat and you still go by the same username, guess what? Hackers are going to get a database of all these people and try it on other places like Dropbox and stuff like that to see what they can find. So evidently it's actually the user's fault themselves that Dropbox got compromised by repeatedly using the same password over and over and over again on the different sites. So I would caution you to be very wary of that. Once one site that you deal with gets hacked, if it's a site that has the password that you use for other things, and especially anything to do with your, your banking or something like that, it's one thing to have your Facebook or your YouTube compromised, but um, don't use that same password for your banking business or anything like that, uh, especially if your username is you know something uh, close to the same. So anyway, to me, I would not put the blame on uh, Dropbox for this at all. And uh, if in doubt, even if you haven't gotten the email and you're not absolutely sure, just uh, like Dropbox says, just say, just claim you forgot your password. That's how they ask you to reset it anyway. Just use your email, say I forgot my password. They'll give you a reset um, link, and then you just go to that link and just type in a new password. So I would advise that for everybody. So be very careful about their, about reusing passwords and using overly simple passwords. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.